Good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending on which side of the country you're on. Thank you so much for joining us right now um, for this post-argument debrief. We're going to spend the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so talking about the important things that were discussed in the case today, and uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop case, and how those uh, in, in impact the First Amendment. Uh, my name is Brian Neihardt. I'm legal counsel at Alliance Defending uh, Freedom for the Center for Conscience Initiatives. I'm here with Jonathan Scruggs, who is senior counsel, vice president of litigation strategy, uh, and director of the Center for Conscience Initiatives. Um, John, I'll just start with the general question for you. What were some of your kind of high-level takeaways uh, from the argument this morning? Yeah, it was really interesting. It was lively. I think it kind of lived up to expectations, um, you know, difficult questions for all sides. I, I think I was really struck at the end. Uh, kind of going in reverse order, when you could kind of see the logical consequences of the other side's argument, basically admitting that, hey, we can, we should be able to force the Jewish cake artist to celebrate the KKK. Uh, and I think that's exactly where the argument takes you. And I think Jake Warner, who's arguing for Masterpiece, pushed back in his closing remark saying, that's exactly where we're going. And that's exactly why their theory can't be right. And our theory is exactly right. Uh, that we, the First Amendment respects all sides and respects, you know, people, whether the LGBT artist or the Christian or the atheist or whatever. So that was really something that struck me kind of as time went on the argument, you could see the logical consequences coming out to play. Um, and th that's kind of my main takeaway. What, what, what was your takeaway? You've, you know, worked and lived in Colorado. You're kind of our Colorado expert. So what was your main takeaway? From well, yeah, I think you're exactly right. And that's part of the you know, f fun part of oral argument is that you have uh, seven justices in this case asking questions about the limits of arguments. And that typically often is a question that we have in these types of cases. And what is the limit that we're proposing? And does that make sense versus what are the limits that the other side is proposing? And I think you're exactly right that the First Amendment is designed to protect all Americans' freedom of speech, regardless of whether we agree with those views or not. And in fact, it's often particularly important when you look historically on views that are not popular. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, yeah, I did think the, the questions were interesting. You know, in these cases, we often get a lot of hypothetical questions. Um, uh, sometimes they, they come in four parts, as, as one of the questions from Justice Hart uh, came in four parts. Um, were there any, uh, you mentioned one of the hypotheticals, are there any other that really struck you as kind of getting at the heart of, of what's, a, what's at issue in this case? Well, I think, you know, maybe some of the pride flag, a rainbow flag, uh, hypos. So I think one of the big debates you see, especially on the First, analysis, the First Amendment analysis, is kind of the use versus the context. Right. And one confusion that was coming up throughout the argument, I think, is, is, you know, hey, you know, the other side was trying to paint our argument as way too broad and saying, oh, it's how this product is being used later on, which has never been an argument. And we made that quite clear in the briefing. And J I think Jake did a good job of highlighting it. It's about the context right. of, you know, what the cake, you know, when someone comes in, they're asked to create a cake. The cake doesn't exist yet. Or the the requested speech, it could be the website in 303. It doesn't exist yet. So the people are saying, this is what I want you to create. Um, and so that's part of the context. And what that's what the Supreme Court has said, is like you need a an intent to communicate something, but also the, the third person in context would view it as communicating a message. And so you see those type of debates. And I think the pride flag, is a good example of that. If, you know, the rainbow flag, uh, if someone comes in and says, make me a rainbow flag to celebrate, you know, uh, God's covenant with Noah, that communicates one message. But if someone comes in and says, I want to do it to celebrate, you know, gay pride, that communicates a different message. And that's just part of the context of what the cake communicates. And I think that's just kind of common sense when you think about it. And again, goes to the, what Jake kept on saying, this goes to the heart of the compelled speech doctrine, it goes to the heart of the conscience factor in there, that what you're being asked to create, that affects you know, your heart and mind and, and what you're being compelled. So those are just some interesting hypos. What are yeah, the other hypos yeah. missing? Well, and one of the things that was also discussed you know, in these, in these situations, there's always kind of, what are the distinctions that you're drawing? And one of the distinctions that uh, our clients constantly draw is this idea of pre-made versus custom-made. And there was lots of questions about that. Obviously, the difference is if, if something is already made, there's no compelled speech because he's, the, the, the product or the expression has already been created. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter then what it's subsequently used for. Versus in this case, when, you're, when Jack was specifically asked for a specific cake that communicated a specific message, he's um, 
you know, using his artistic ability to communicate that message. And one of the and well, let me let me stop you right there. And this is not something we just made up. It's not right. just like a right. distinction that we came up with in yeah. air. The U.S. Supreme Court acknowledged this distinction as far back as 1945. There's a famous case where the court said, "Hey, you know, uh, the AP, the Associated Press, could they be forced to sell their kind of news stories?" Uh, it was an anti kind of antitrust right. action, and the court said, "Yes." You could be forced to just sell your off-the-shelf news stories to other media entities. You can't create a monopoly. But the government went on, uh, the court went on and said it would be different if we were trying to force the AP to write the stories, i.e. create it from scratch. So you see that distinction between off-the-shelf and uh, uh, custom. Right. Yeah, and in fact, one of the, you mentioned the exchanges. That One of the interesting exchanges I thought was Justice Marquez asked, uh, the plaintiff's attorney, what if someone came in and just asked for the, the cake artist to create a cake to celebrate a gender transition without having specified the exact design? Mm -hmm. And my, my recollection was that the plaintiff's attorney said, yeah, that would, that would be compelled speech yeah. because the context matters and he's being asked, the baker's being asked to create something using his art, artistic ability. That seems to me to be identical to what happened here. Well, I think I'll go even farther. I think this case is even worse. Right. Right. Because one thing to say, hey, make whatever you think here. They said, I want you to make this specific design that celebrates this specific message uh, that everyone would recognize would convey a message, you know, in this context that it violates your beliefs. You know, as the trial court found the blue cake requested blue on the inside, pink on the outside. The blue symbolizes male, the pink symbolizes female. So everyone would recognize that. So this, this case is even easier than that hypo. I thought that was a really, as you know, really illuminating hypo that was discussed where the other side admitted, hey, you can't force someone to do that. Well, this is an easier case right. uh, than that one. And that's a good point about the trial court because um, this case did go through an actual trial. And, and in law, once the trial court makes a factual finding, that's typically binding, although not always in, in the First Amendment context because courts are supposed to look at issues anew. But when you say the trial court found that and found that this particular case communicated a particular message, that's pretty significant, isn't it? It is. It is. Like you said, it's complicated because when you have constitutional rights at stake, uh, the appellate court has more leeway to look at the factual findings, uh, and that comes into play, that they're going to have to look at those things, which would allow the U.S. Supreme Court also right. to, to evaluate those things. Right. But, I mean, even though the trial court ruled against us below, we can talk about what the trial was like. Um, you know, the trial court made these significant factual findings that actually help us, that everyone agrees that this cake symbolized this message, and of course it does. The person came in, Scardina, Autumn Scardina came in, the attorney, and said, I want this cake to celebrate and symbolize my gender transition because blue symbolizes one, you know, male, pink symbolizes female. Of course that conveys a message. Like, so that's the whole purpose of the cake. That's why Scardina went there right. to force Jack, and I'll use the quote from the trial, to correct the errors of his thinking. Yeah. That was the whole reason Scardina went to Masterpiece Cake Shop was to force Jack to convey a message he disagreed with. So, of course, it didn't convey to us. Right. And, and that's a good point. Another thing that, um, in fact, Jake started, uh, Jake Warner, attorney for ADF, started off this way. He said in his introduction, it's always about the message and never about the person. And Justice Hart asked a series of uh, four hypothetical questions, one where there's pink and blue cake to celebrate a gender transition, one where it was uh, meant for a, a birthday or fraternal twins or something like that, and kind of went through the series. Uh, the obvious difference between those is one is, used to convey a particular message that um, Jack uh, uh, conflicts with Jack's religious beliefs about how God created males and females versus the other ones uh, communicate different messages. And so it doesn't matter who is requesting uh, the cake. It's about what the cakes are communicating. Yeah. And part of the context being right. what the person is being told at the time they're right. creating. And that goes through the hypos about, you know, what about, you know, again, the, the African-American cake right. designer who's asked by, you know, the, uh, uh, not the KKK, but you know, the, the uh, Aryan Nation Church to create a white cross cake to celebrate, the, you know, uh, uh, racism, right? Of course, you know, that cake designer might create that white cross cake for someone else to symbolize you know, the crucifixion, but wouldn't create it for the KKK group. Right. And again, that goes to the point of these things are very contextual, and part of the context is the design of the cake that's being requested, what the person is, is asking for. Um, and again, that flows straight from Supreme Court precedent. 
uh, I, I think, uh, and even 303 Creative. Uh, and let's let's talk about 303 Creative, but I wanted to mention one other point that I thought was important that, again, Justice Marquez, who asked a lot of good questions today, uh, raised. She said, um, it, it's not about the knowledge of what it's being used for, but about the message that it's being asked to express. I'm yeah. paraphrasing, but I thought that was a good way to distinguish this idea of use versus uh, message. Um, and you mentioned 303 Creative. That came up a lot uh, in this case, as we kind of expected that it would. It's the most recent Supreme Court a decision talking about compelled speech, and it, it applied. Uh, it found that Colorado could not use its public accommodation law, which is the same law that's at issue here, to compel our client, Lori Smith, to create custom websites celebrating a view of marriage that conflicted with her religious beliefs. And um, it seemed like um, there was lots of talk about the stipulations as a way to try to limit uh, 303 Creative. But could you explain uh, why those stipulations um, aren't, don't limit 303 just to those facts, but in fact the Supreme Court announced broader principles that yeah. the compelled speech, the governments cannot compel speech uh, by individuals that violates their conscience. Yeah. It's the classic move by lawyers. When you don't like a case, you get up there and say, well, those facts are different. Like, it's limited to those facts, right? But, of course, 303 is not just about, you know, website designers in Colorado who have a one-person design. You know, the every case that the Supreme Court decides are, are based on facts, but the principles they announce go broader than that. And so they, uh, you know, announced v these various principles. They provided a test that we articulated uh, that should apply to this case, right? Uh, 303 Creative isn't just a one-way ticket. It, it doesn't only protect Lori Smith as the only person in American history that this Supreme Court decision protects. It protects other people, too, if, you know, that's how legal reasoning works. You take the analysis of the case and you say, which facts are necessary to the reasoning, which ones aren't, what the legal principles they apply here. And we think they apply on all points. And even to go, I'll give you a good example of this, is the attribution yeah. argument uh, that, okay. that came up, that there's a lot of disputes like, well, how is this Jack Phillips um, speech, right, that Autumn Scardina came and asked for it, so the real speaker is Autumn Scardina, it's not Jack right. Phillips. Well, 303 just rejected that argument flat out, right, because the same thing happened there, right? Uh, you know, uh, Lori Smith is in business. She creates websites for other people. Same thing for a speechwriter, same thing for a ghostwriter, same right. thing for a, you know, a newspaper, a lawyer. We can go on that there's all these situations where someone is a commissioned speaker, yet they still have the right. They're the ones creating the speech. Uh, that's why actually copyright law gives the copyright to the person creating the speech. Right? They're the creators. They're the authors. They're the speakers. Uh, the compelled speech doctrine doesn't go away just because someone asks you to do something, and it doesn't give the government the, you know, the right to compel you to say anything you want to just because you're in business. Right. So that goes to the point that 303 should protect this case and it should be on all fours with it. Right, yeah, I thought that kind of what they've talked about, the attribution principle or whose speech is it was an uh, interesting dynamic. Of course, you mentioned the, the newspaper, which is common sense just because a newspaper accepts an, an op-ed that's a decision, a speech decision that this newspaper is making, even though this op-ed might be written by someone else or you think of just kind of common sense. Um, principles across the history of uh, artwork. And there's lots of, you know, the Renaissance was artists were commissioned by others, but no one thinks of the uh, statue or the painting as being the commissioner's uh, speech. It's the artist's speech. Mm -hmm. And that's just, otherwise, um, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the classic is, uh, you know, Michelangelo right. did the Sistine Chapel, right? That's who did it, right? right. It just because Michelangelo was commissioned by someone else to do it, it's still Michelangelo's speech. But I think we're, we're kind of jumping to the entree before we get to the appetizer. Okay. Uh, you know, there was all this discussion about kind of these procedural arguments yeah. about, you know, is there claim, claim preclusion, all these things. What was your takeaway from that, the first part of the argument? Yeah, I think there's a lot of technical uh, kind of aspects to it, but I just think fundamentally the kind of way to look at it is what's fair. And essentially what's happened is Jack has now been prosecuted for uh, many, many years on this particular case, not counting Masterpiece, one that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, and it's essentially given the plaintiff uh, two bites at the apple. The plaintiff didn't like what happened at the commission level, and that went all the way to its end. And so that, um, under the Court of Appeals reasoning in this case, the plaintiff can just go back and file a separate civil lawsuit and do the whole thing all over again, learning, you know, from the first case and those types of uh, the first, the commission's order and, and, and that. Uh, the other thing to think about is, um, you know, Colorado law offers plaintiffs a choice at the beginning. They can choose to go to the commission route or choose to file in civil court. And each choice comes with pros and cons. And so, again, going to the fundamental fairness, it's not fair to allow the 
the plaintiff to make one choice at the beginning, thinking that it's going to maximize benefits, not like the outcome there, and then turn around and going to Avenue Two uh, when that road, you know, should be closed. And so I yep. thought I thought Jake did a good job of explaining that in our briefs. You know, go into the details about some other situations that might arise that just kind of create fundamental unfairness, not only for the person defending the lawsuit, but also for future claimants in Colorado that might not be able to afford to go to civil court uh, if they lose at the commission. Yep. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. The, the way I like to think about it is like, it's like a road trip. Right. You, you're, you can either choose the scenic route or the efficiency route. Right. And like you said, they're kind of pros and cons. You, you go the efficiency route, the kids are screaming less. You're good to go. You go the scenic route, you get to see the beautiful things, but you got to make the choice up front and then you got to live with your consequences. Right. And they had that choice. And I think it's exactly right, as you noted, that it's really affects future litigants, right? Because not everyone can afford to go to state court and pay for a lawsuit. What that the other side's argument essentially does, would it, it would basically, you know, take that right away from those people. It'd make it harder for people right. to litigate their rights, which is one of the arguments that we made in our briefing. Anyway, right. yeah, I agree with that. Um, Let's see. I'm looking to see, make sure we covered what I thought was uh, most important. Any other um, any other takeaways that you wanted to discuss that we haven't talked about? We've covered covered an hour of uh, of briefing and decades and decades of First Amendment precedent in a short period of time. Anything else that well, you would like? Well, let me to? ask you this: Like, how long do you think a ruling takes? Uh, what What do you know? Have a sense of timeline uh, on how quickly the court gets out their opinions? You know, the U.S. Supreme Court has a bit of a regular schedule. They basically get out all their decisions by the end of um, end of June, but Colorado operates on a different schedule. Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, it's hard to say. I don't, the, you're right that the Colorado Supreme Court doesn't have a set deadline for when each term needs to announce all of their decisions, so it's kind of hard to say. I think, um, you know, sometimes I've seen cases that take, uh, it seems like an eternity to announce, and sometimes they come much shorter, but I would assume it would be, um, you know, no, no, it won't, won't be soon, it won't be the next couple of months, but it might be the next six months to a year that we get a decision in this case. And, and what do you think is kind of take take a couple steps away, like the broad, you know, Jack has now been in litigation for 12 years, right? right? Like since 2012, uh, we call this case Masterpiece 3. This is the third right. round of the case. Um, you know, what does this say just about, you know, our legal system, American culture in general, right, that we're, we're still here, right? Jack is still there. He, he's still in business, thank God, uh, and he, he's plugging along, but... As as you know, has been talked about at the kind of the pre-discussion we had, you know, he's had to go through this litigation. Right. His family's had to go through trial. He's lost business, lost customers. You know, what do you uh, are you hopeful? Are you not hopeful? What, what what's the takeaway? Well, I think it says more about Jack than anything else. And one thing that I you know I've, I've met him. In fact, I'm wearing I'm wearing his uh, his t-shirt masterpiece cake shop t-shirt today to to honor that. But it says more about Jack. And I think what it says is uh, it just shows how steadfast he has been throughout these 12 years that. Um, he has he's he's decided what his convictions are based on his his religious beliefs. He stood by those convictions at great personal cost, not only to himself but also to his family, as he mentioned in the uh, pre-argument discussion. And um, you know, it, it's a it's a series of you know, faithfulness is often a series of just seemingly small at the time choices that someone makes over a lifetime. And I think that Jack has been incredibly faithful in all these decisions that he's made, these, the ones that we see publicly uh, that result in uh, Supreme Court litigation, but also in just the day-to-day -day way that he lives his life, um, going to Bible study, going to church, ministering to his friends and family and those around him. So uh, I am hopeful for that reason, because it is, it is a privilege and an honor to be able to represent people like him and Lori Smith who make those types of courageous decisions um, every day. Yeah, no, it's a really good point in the sense of, you know, no one told him in 2012, right. hey, this is what you're signing up for when you make this decision. Right. Uh, but he was faithful in that, and, and he's experienced ups and downs. There's no doubt about it, right? right? I mean, he's, he's won at the U.S. Supreme Court. I think 303 Creative will be, even though he wasn't, his case was, we get a, you know, a high point that hopefully will protect him. But to go to your point about faithfulness, and I also, I go back to the point that you talked to Jack about this, and you see this in Jake's argument, right. is again, we're the side saying protect everybody. Right. Like we want to protect the LBG, LGBT artists. We want to protect the atheist artist. And the other side's argument is, like, hey, we can force people to violate their conscience. Um, and of course, it, you know, when it comes down to play, they're kind of picking and choosing, right? right. Uh, again, the factual scenario here is the same day that right. Jack's case was heard at the Supreme Court. So the same day it went, it hit the media. Everyone's talking about, hey, this case is going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. It just so happens that same day, 
this attorney calls Jack and says, make me this cake. And that same attorney had, would ask Jack to create a cake uh, of Satan, right. you know, smoking marijuana. The same attorney had said things like, hey, had emailed Jack and said, you know, you're a bigot and things like that. So I think there's a clear t- case of harassment and targeting. Right. And I think the end of the day takeaway is how do we respond to that? Right. Like we live in this pluralistic society and Jay, uh, Jack is a good example. Like throughout this whole experience, he hasn't become bitter. Right. Right, like he's just plugging along, you know, serving people. Uh, one of the people who te- testified at his trial uh, identifies as gay, and they've struck up a great Jack, and he has struck up a great friendship uh, because, you know, I think it's a good example, a paradigm example of what tolerance should look like, yes. right? And how do we love people in this context where even if we disagree with them, so he gives he gives a good example of that. I think you see all the foil right. sometimes in some of these cases as well. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, like, um, uh, uh, kind of I'll end where we began, which is where uh, Jake started off by saying it's always about uh, the what is being asked to create, not the who. And Jack serves everybody. He just doesn't create all messages. Um, and, um, well, thank you so much for joining this live stream event. We've really appreciated your, your attention to this case and uh, your support of Jack. Um, and uh, we're just so privileged, as I said, to be able to represent him in court and all of our other clients who are um, being faithful to their religious beliefs, to live out their faith in public, and um, to minister to others. And so uh, we're just thankful for that. And um, if you'd like to learn more about Jack's case or stay updated on what the future uh, looks like, please go to www.adflegal.org. You can find out about Jack's case, stay updated on the eventual outcome of the Colorado Supreme Court's decision, as you mentioned, uh, as well as our many other cases where we're protecting the First Amendment rights of our clients, and by extension, the rights of all Americans to uh, live and speak consistent with their with their beliefs. So, so thank you so much, and thank you, John, for, for your time. Thank you.